All right. It's more to come. Uh, the next uh, panel is going to be moderated and directed by uh, Harrison Fraker. So please, Harrison. Welcome back, everybody. This is the last panel. So um, I hope everybody will have their most demanding questions um, uh, for all of us. But we're going to romp through a series of presentations that I hope will um, help you zero in on your questions. I'm going to give a very quick talk about uh, a couple of the case studies where I tried to use insights from neuroscience to give a new reading of why these places were meaningful. And then we're going to have a series of other uh, presentations. So let me start right away. Julio has already given an introduction to me, so we don't need to repeat it. Then we get your okay. And arrows are forward and back. Okay, excellent. Okay, so here I am. And the simple question is: are there insights from neuroscience which really will help us understand what makes a place meaningful, poetic? even sacred. So I had a long interest in this going back to Princeton about perception and cognition and read some of these early folks. And the book that I've written was really prompted because I felt that the aesthetic and sensorial and visceral experience of the city was largely missing in the discourse on urban design. Not entirely, but pretty much um, not, not the focus. And um, urban design had become preoccupied with big data, with mapping, with abstract figure ground, and a kind of notion about the city that was pattern making, um, and had left out the, the important experiences of the city. I also read Sarah Robinson's book, Mind and Architecture, and um, it sort of confirmed um, and opened my eyes to some of these insights from neuroscience. I also felt that public space in cities is an underdeveloped resource. Most of the public spaces are pretty generic and they haven't had the thought and design attention that they truly deserve. And given climate change and sustainability, we're gonna to have to remake those public spaces. And best of all, the remaking of those spaces with sustainable systems is a way to make the city more meaningful, to have it be a much richer visceral, visceral experience. So I did this book and here are my extracts from a neuroscience. I said earlier, the desire for meaning is really important. It's been confirmed by neuro, uh, neuroimaging and it's not just for the elite, but it's meaningful for all participants of the city. Mirror neurons are really important. Uh, it's been explained that when you see a cup of coffee, it's not just a visual experience. We empathize with picking it up, holding it, feeling its warmth, spelling the coffee. Um, it's a much richer thing that is um, activated through our neuro neuro neurons. So you can see in the images on the right, in the lacoon, we empathize with the struggle. When we see dance, apparently our, neuro, uh, our mirror neurons empathize with the dancer. We feel the weight, the improbable weight of the suspended boulder in the Montgrete. We feel uh, the slump from the cut in the Matta Clark uh, sculpture, but we also perceive the actual cut that made it happen. So it's a very rich way in which we empathize with uh, the physical environment. And the last one, uh, uh, the Richter painting, we really appreciate the scrape that he used to take the original uh, painting application and turn it into what is a kind of blurred thing, almost like it's in a puddle of water. So meaning, and then obviously we've had the discussion about affordances. Um, meaning can come from what something enables, not just what it looks like. 
And we had a conversation about how complicated and interesting that can be. So the point is that meaning is not just an abstract concept in the brain, it's fully embodied uh, through these uh, various mechanisms. Um, I love this idea that there are kinds of attention. I don't wanna dwell on this, but it really means that we exist in a world where we have this overall synthesizing um, perception, and we have a very detailed and elaborate analysis of the environment. And these things can go on simultaneously, but there are two ways of being in the world, and they're really useful. Uh, and apparently, they were critical for our survival, that we needed to have the big picture, and we needed to have the details in order to survive. And the point is that perception is done in a total way across all of our senses. I love this idea of um, building up image schemata or embodied forms, this idea of containment. Um, I'm now where I have grandchildren and great-grandchildren and to watch them climb in and out of a box over and over and over again, um, understanding what it means to be inside and outside. They have to stand up. They have to have balance. They experience forces. They love making something and knocking it down. Uh, they are embodied in the world in such a way that it's amazing. The crawling, the walking, the somersaults, the jumping, all of these things are um, what enable us to understand and build meaning in the environment. This also can be translated into spatial form concepts. This is pretty architectural for everybody here. The idea that when you have a point and you slide it, that's a process that we empathize with, you have a line. When you have that line and you move it horizontally, you have a plane. When you move the plane, you have a volume. And then you can operate on this thing in some ways. You can subtract from it, you can add to it, or in this, example here, oops, in the last one, in this one here, you can understand that this procession into the building is then folded back on itself to create the platform for the galleries in this museum. So there's a kind of embodied uh, understanding of that transformative fold. So let's look at some places. So Haley Park in New York is infamous. They've actually measured that in the summertime, it's 10 to 12 degrees cooler than the surrounding blocks. Yeah. Um, and it's, this place is way more than just an environmental fix. Um, we have the mirror neurons that empathize with the, let's see if I, can you see my cursor? This is the forecourt, which embraces you, invites you in with the trees. You come inside and you're enclosed with green walls and a water wall. You have uh, many, many ways you can sit. You can be together, you can be alone, you can be on the edge, you can be near the water. You, can ha you have this variety of ways of um, experiencing the space. You have this microclimate, created by the evaporative cooling off the water wall and the evapotranspiration of the green walls. You have an amazing sensory engagement. The sound of the water separates you from the city in a kind of white noise way. Um, you've had to rise up into the space, the smell, the materials, the touch of the materials. You have all kinds of ways to sit. The feel of this microclimate on the skin and the dap of light are all amazing. So you have this amazing um, atmosphere that is created here. Um, and it happens instantly, but then you go back and appreciate all the ways that it's been created. Okay, this is also this is Scarpa's little courtyard off the Biennale. Have any of you been here? So what amazed us about this, again, context is so important. You've been in a gallery, you've looked at paintings for three hours, 
you're friggin' exhausted. You go through this door and what do you get? The sky. It's just amazing how important getting the sky is. You're also embraced by these fabulous green walls that kind of are softer and more comfortable. And then there's this amazing soffit that's been put in the space that is very low. You know, I can touch it, but it creates shadows. It creates places to sit. And the other thing is it has these big honking tiers that hold it up, but there's a little brass marble that the thing sits on. So it's just floating there as if nothing was holding it up. And there are cutouts in the corner which expand the space even though it's been held. So there's a simultaneous give and take. It just means that there's this in completely different sensory experience than going through and gazing, what was it, 17 seconds in front of each painting and while reading the label and you're exhausted, all of a sudden you get this. One of the magic things about it is that there is water, evaporative cooling, transpiration, a natural ventilation that comes through underneath. But do you see this? This little, these are lilies. This is a copper lily and they're fountains. The water hits the copper lily and tinkles. There's a sound in the space that is very, very soothing. And what happens when this ring is reflected? Where does it go? On the underneath side of the soffit. So you have this visual echo of an acoustical presence in the space, which is amazing, which adds to the sense of this being a kind of escape, an oasis, a calm. And there's this amazing uh, aesthetic experience from all the senses in this space. So here neuroscience with all those categories has helped us understand why, even though this is not well known, it has a kind of significance. So I thought for this conference, I ought to take a look at something which I, we'd all, all of us had visited this, we shared in our appreciation and understanding from these insights of neuroscience. I haven't been to the place that I'm going to show you. I have been in my imagination. And I think insights from neuroscience are so important to why this is an amazing place. So how many of you have been here? <laughs> I knew it. So uh, this is Peter Zumthor's uh, 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 Bruder Klaus Chapel sits in the middle of a field. And to see a monolith like that floating in the middle of a, of a field kind of it arouses curiosity. What the hell is this, right? Why is this here? What is it doing? This big stone thing, it could be primitive. Who, how did it get here? What is it all about? So there's an amazing path to it and this pivoting door, and you come inside, and I'll do it. And uh, the kind of light source sneaking in along a lead floor, which absorbs light. So the light from the top is not, comes in and is absorbed on the floor, and it sparkles. So, this is otherworldly, wouldn't you say? And that's what Mercier Iliad has said is sacred. When something becomes otherworldly worldly and is outside of our experience because it's a totally new experience. So as you go inside, you realize that it's this little chapel. And suddenly you're aware of this amazing smell. It's so dominant, you can't believe it. It's like when you've been inside a burned house, there's the smell of fire in this space. It's really powerful. And you wonder how the hell was this thing made? You know, 
the texture, it's rough. And yet there are these little sparkle lights that come through. There's this floor, there's this top. What's the story here? What's, what is the story that explains the power of, of this kind of atmosphere, this initial amazing experience? Do you all know the story? Some do. This was all made by farmers who wanted to honor uh, the patron saint of their area. So Zumthor got them to build a teepee out of wood logs. Teepee, primal form, right? Is this a teepee or am I praying? With my hands, right? When you make a fire, a campfire, lots of times you make it as a stacked teepee. So they built this teepee. They encased it with concrete. And you can, oops, you can see here that you have to hold the formwork to the wood um, logs. So there's a hole through the concrete here. So what did they do? And I've never been able to find a picture of this. They burned the inside out. So they subtracted the wood that made the space by burning it. And it left its trace, not only in the formwork, but in the actual quality of the concrete, the smell of the burn on the inside. And what's amazing, you see all the sparkles? Those are the things that held the formwork in place. And they put little clear marbles there. So it's like you're in a constellation of stars. So what a place to go and contemplate and pray to the uh, patron saint of this area, uh, an amazing central experience that is powerfully aesthetic. And I would argue um, an amazing sacred place. And here's where I think I wouldn't have appreciated this in the same way without the insights of neuroscience. So now we're gonna see wonderful people who are using these ideas in their design work. So let me start. Juliet, um, Juliet King. Um, she's an associate professor of art therapy at George Washington University and adjunct associate professor of neurology at the Indiana University School of Medicine. Wow, nice combination. Professor King's research centers on systematic integration of art therapy and neuroscience with a focus on neuroaesthetics and contemporary neuro imaging to clarify psychological mechanisms of change in the creative arts therapies. Take Thank it away. You. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here for the short time that I'm able to be here. Um, and thank you, Julio, for the invitation. I'm going to make this a bold statement to say, where's Zach? Where did he go? Oh, he's going to miss my exciting bold statement. I'm going to say that art therapy is the reason, a core reason why our friend Zach is here. And the reason for that is because as a professor of art therapy at GW, one of my beautiful students, Yasia Sanapur, the wife of Amir, um, was talking to Amir about my interest in neuroscience and art therapy. I've been working on this integration of neuroscience and art therapy for over a decade. And Amir being interested in experiential methods for how one can teach and understand architecture was introduced to me. And so Amir and I started chatting and then Amir introduced me to Julio. 
So then the three of us began talking. And the more I listened, I thought, you know what? Julio's got to meet my buddy Zach over in Denmark because this guy is like, Whoa. So then we pull in Yoshi, right, and got a chance to work together on a paper, which hopefully is the beginning of many ideas, right? And I'm really psyched to be here because at my core is a commitment to collaboration and translation. And that really, in my field of art therapy and translational sciences, is really what makes an impact. You know, I'm here to create opportunities and provide opportunities that can enhance the healing potential for people. That's what art therapists do. It's a psychotherapy. It's a mental health profession, right? That provides psychological services and support for people in need. And as time goes on, you know, our therapists have been around since the 1940s. And I know I only have a short amount of time, like 10 minutes. So I need to explain what our therapy is. And I'm going to start by with this thing working. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start with the beginning of human civilization, right? Where and then we just heard about how humans have evolved cognitively with symbol, with language to communicate their experiences. And we've been doing this since we the beginning of time, practically, right? We use the image and the symbol to show who we are and that we're here. And on the caves of Lascaux, we have evidence of people saying, this is what was important to us, the social interaction, the ability to let people know what's happening within and around them. We use the symbol on an individual through personal, through universal, through collective levels as we're hearing, right? We use that symbol as a place of healing, such as what the Tibetan monks are doing, right? And these healing practices have been around since the beginning of time. In these caves also, we see instruments made of bone and stone and we can start to piece together and understand that the processes of creativity have also evolved out of our need for survival right we are sensory based beings the heartbeat the first to hear and the last to be forgotten we come out of the womb as a body ego, one might say, or as a body where data and information is being processed before we even have the cognition to know that we're separate from our caregiver or that our hand is even attached to us. So therefore, it makes all the sense in the world when we're considering the capacities for how internal and external influences inform our perception that we really come back to these senses and sensory processing. Let's fast forward a couple hundred centuries where Raphael and the School of Athens helped us see a convergence of the arts and sciences with the advent of perspective, the trick of the eye that allows us an illusion, that allows us some kind of magic to embody the experience of the person that made it. And I wonder if Raphael knew that a lot of the processes in the brain for science and art are somewhat similar. And here we have the quintessential Renaissance man, right? Helping us understand the convergence of the arts and the sciences as the root of innovation where mental and cultural and spiritual spheres of influence help to inform our ways of communicating, understanding ourselves and one another. And this takes a range of scientific inquiry, which I like to call ways of knowing, right? We have our empirical data, super important, obviously. And then we have the sciences of the social sciences and psychology. And then we have the transcendent and the spiritual ways of understanding, and we need them all. And our capacities to traverse the continuum are profound when we come together, work together to understand how to gather data, 
what does that data look like? And knowing that numbers and the scientific method can't always help us understand the true phenomenological experience of the human being, right? We use the image and the symbol to communicate complicated concepts that are difficult to express with words, such as the pain of gout and the agony of suffering. The work of William Udermolen, which I think has probably done more for our society to understand the deleterious effects of dementia and Alzheimer's disease when it was published in the New York Times. Udermolen was an artist that documented the disease progression and helped people see what was happening internally and it also helped to promote a conversation because when we deal with disease such as dementia, our verbal capacities are often limited. So the artwork helped him not only show what was happening, but help the caregivers and people around him understand. So around the turn of the 19th, 20th century, I always get this messed up. Let's just say early 1900s. So that would be the turn of the 20th century. Yes. So Rorschach, our buddy, we all know about the ink blots and the value of the projective testing. And oftentimes the scientists will turn their nose up and their face down or whatever it is about how projective testing and the Rorschach test just doesn't stand up in court and it doesn't stand up to give enough evidence to say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what we also know is that Rorschach's work, along with that and the father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, not a perfect guy, not everything holds up, but the first to articulate that cogent theory of the unconscious, which is very important for us as we seek to understand the many different ways that our bodies and brains process our experiences and how we're able to connect and understand those experiences with another. Around these times, Hans Prinzhorn, an art historian and also analyst put together, which remains the largest collection of artwork of the mentally ill in Heidelberg, Germany. So these people have helped us through imagery, through a person's projection, talking about an inkblot, through the creation of their own artwork, really help us understand what is non-clinical, what is normal, and what is mental health and illness. As we're advancing with technology, neuroimaging, FNIRS, EEG, my best friend, mobile brain body imaging, right, that allows to capture in real world environments what's happening inside of our brains, we are learning more about functional connectivity and large scale brain networks. I'm speaking to the choir here. I don't know how I have to tell you all of this, but we know that the creative activity when you're making art and even when you're viewing art, there are physiological and psychological benefits to that. Now the art therapist sees a distinction between what's creative expression and what is the flow state and what is what we might call sublimation, moving energy from one place to another, a rather antiquated term, all of which though we know is very healthy for us. And we also know that every single human being has the capacity to be creative. So we can consider art as a feedback loop. And we know that the brain is a predictive machine and mental imagery and artistic creation are inextricably linked. While we can understand that information processing is really complicated, we know that art making helps us to externalize, identify, and define our own experiences. When we make art, we're engaging kinesthetic, sensory, visual systems, and that all influences our perception. When our brains and our bodies and what it is that we see and what it is that we make are in action, we are constantly preparing ourselves to understand what's going to come next by what happened before, right? And so this gives us a way to think about 
how it is that we are seeing and experiencing things now, what is it that happened to us from our past? And how is it that we can use the art process and what is it that we are seeing, viewing, and talking about to inform the ways that we want to move forward? And of course, this involves many different dimensional systems of cognition and emotion, conscious and unconscious, but ultimately, when we engage in art, that's action. Action informs our perception, and our perception, of course, informs our behavior. So I like to describe what our therapy is on a continuum. On one end of the continuum, you've got therapeutic arts, and that's listening to a cellist in the hospital on a cancer unit, and people hear the music and they feel better. These are therapeutic arts. You're walking in this space, right? You're walking down the halls. I walked into this space and then see all these offices. And, oh, there's some awe here. Oh, I want to work in this place. I love the lighting. Oh, look, it's so arty here. It feels really good, and it's very clean. Architects seem to be very clean, right? Okay, so we know that ultimately we feel differently when we're engaged in therapeutic arts and other down here on this continuum is the medical and healthcare profession of art therapy that does require a master's degree in art therapy to practice. And we are part of the creative arts therapies that also include dance movement therapy, music therapy, and psychodrama. So really important to emphasize or what I have come up with is a way to capture the ontoepistemological inputs, right? From philosophy, psychology, aesthetics, neuroscience over the generations to really distill a definition and what I say are the tenets of art therapy. And ultimately that comes down to the capacities for both verbal and nonverbal communication within the therapeutic relationship. The cellist on the cancer unit walking into a cool space where you feel differently, that's not indicating a therapeutic relationship, right? Therapy takes place in a relationship, no matter what kind of therapy you are practicing, it's the therapeutic relationship, that element that's the most healing. The materials and methods that we use in our therapy are indicated to engage different areas of the brain and body. So thoughtful interventions are put forward using the properties of materials, for example, Watercolors are less resistive. They're going to evoke different kinds of emotional, effective perceptual systems than are a protractor, a ruler, and a pencil. And of course, the process of creativity, which is a compound construct. Most neuroscientists say, no thanks, because neuroscientists need to be very mechanical, right? So the brave and the bold allow themselves to study the creativity and creative process in the brain, where we can see the functional hubs and networks and large scale brain networks that are active and connected together throughout the creative processes. Making art in the in the relationship within that therapeutic space allows the potential for people to communicate difficult emotions and feelings that we know with science are also limited. For example, when people endure stress and trauma, the Broca's area, the talk centers of the brain shut down while the sympathetic nervous system is on fire, the limbic system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm probably, are you giving two minutes? I have so much time, this is great. So art making within that relationship allows for a visual voice and it allows for people to find words for themselves, to be able to pinpoint and articulate what it is that they've been through and experienced. So art therapists use the art making process and the products that are created as a representative of that person's self and meaning making. That's been a common theme today, right? In the creation of a narrative, 
Art therapists are not looking at pictures on the wall and asking people to perform a Rorschach type projection, although of course that isomorphic process is a part of it. But what a person says about what it is that they make, that's at the core of the psychotherapeutic process. That is their narrative. And when we endure trauma such as this, what happened, this example here of a woman pre and post combat, and the, the group that she was in were asked to create imagery of themselves before and after combat. Who were they before and after combat? And here, this woman said, before I went to combat, I was happy, I was normal, I was social, I was fun. And then she really didn't have many words for the other image other than to say, this is how I am now. That's a lot of material. What we also understand is that people don't really know how to piece together memories that are fragmented. The way that we experience trauma, and we all experience trauma on different levels. Every single one of us experiences trauma. The way that our brains and bodies process trauma limits severely our verbal capacity to explain and communicate. So with insights through neuroaesthetics and with the understanding that these properties of the world are parallel to those of the mind, we can start to piece together and develop conceptual frameworks to test dynamics of therapy, one, right? The relationship is a really hard thing. It's almost as hard as creativity to come to some kind of mechanistic understanding of. And then when you add the art part to it, it makes it even harder. So the science of neuroaesthetics is advancing us and helping us get there. And I'm gonna stay in my wheelhouse, but allow my wheelhouse to open its doors and offer the many ways that the environment can actually act as the healing agent. And here I'm speaking to the experts, right? You all know a lot more about the value of the environment as influential on the psyche of the person. So when we're talking about space, largely we're also talking about space individually. And part of the exciting conversations that I've had the honor to have with Julio and company is looking at how the philosophies and theoretical underpinnings and science of art therapy and psychotherapy have a lot of parallels to what's happening in the neurophenomenology of the sacred space, of really trying to understand how the space can influence our health and well being. And we must be paying attention to not only the time, but <laughs> the importance of collaboration and identifying the nuances of languages within that. So there you go, thanks. Thank you. So our next speaker, uh, Suchi Reddy, uh, 20 year old award-winning studio, ready-made embodies her ethos of forms follows healing using neuroaesthetics to amplify the potential of design. The practice spans varied typologies of all scales from interiors to installations to architecture. And she currently teaches at the GSAPP at Columbia and the Erwin Chen, Chen, Channon School of Architecture at Cooper Union. So please join me in welcoming Richie. Leave it on the first slide for a little bit, I think. Okay, let me make sure. I have to, I have to go back. No worries. Um, while Lorenzo's getting my slides up there, um, I'll start speaking because I know Julio is watching time and so is Harrison. Um, 
<laughs> Harrison's watching too. But Julia, thank you so much. That was that was really exciting and energizing. And and thank you for opening the door towards talking about um, environments and space and how we can think about healing through neuroaesthetics. Um, I wanted to quickly just talk about why I come to this. Um, I had the privilege of growing up in a house in India that was actually designed by an architect. It wasn't a builder, it was an architect who designed the house. And um, I had an epiphany when I was 10, when I realized that my house was changing me. It was a protagonist in my life. It was making me different than my friends. And as a child, I just took this to be the truth. And this is what sort of took me into the journey of becoming an architect and now through 20 years of my practice, ready-made, um, and brings me to my ethos, um, form follows feeling. So when I graduated from college, I was fairly disenchanted. Um, I think I heard this from Harrison as well, um, that there were some ideas floating around that maybe didn't you know, agree with you. Um, for me, I felt like the discussions were about technologies and about style. And what I was really interested in was bringing the discussion back to the body, to this, what I call the democratic space that we all understand, and we build our worlds outward of our bodies, our clothes, our homes, our cities. It was very important to me that I could understand this. And I came to uh, understanding neuroaesthetics and neuroscience of being interested in it about 10 years ago, um, really as a way of understanding more my own intuition, having some information that could allow me to be a better architect, and really understand the full potential of, of what space can do, which I knew when I was 10 years old. Um, so I just wanted to find out more about it. And yet another thought about that, and a thing that drives sort of my interest in search is, you know, as an, as an architect, you're, we're often um, really uh, influenced by uh, the legacy of the Bauhaus, who 100 years ago used the technology of their time to revolutionize what was happening in architecture. Because you could ask why architecture, why neuroscience, why should we be together? And when I look at the technologies that have really grown in the last few decades, neuroscience has made giant leaps. And I think as architects, if we're not looking at that, um, we really would be leaving something on the table. And I think that's also really important to understand in terms of why us. Um, so further on the subject of why us, as architects, we're trained to be interdisciplinary. We're collaborators. We think about lots of different kinds of fields, whether they're statisticians, urban designers, landscape designers, lighting designers. It's our job to pull all of that together. And the solutions for the complex problems we face right now have to be interdisciplinary. So I think we're perfectly placed to be able to solve some of these problems. And particularly in times of you know, political entrenchment, rising xenophobia, all kinds of turmoil, I think it's even more important on us as architects to really think about how we can be interdisciplinary to maybe solve some problems, to bring some healing into the world. And particularly post pandemic, I think we've seen a mental health crisis that I think is important um, for us to try and address. So as we consider closely every aspect of our built environment, um, I think we're always in the perfect ground for cross-pollination, collaboration and confluence between disciplines, typologies and techniques. And therefore, we need to be borderless. We need to think in a borderless way. And this brings me to a little bit of what my practice um, encompasses these days, which is um, just about everything. Um, and <laughs> one of the questions actually that you get asked often as an architect is, what do you specialize in? And the next question is, what's your style? And neither one of those was I interested in. What I was really interested in was figuring out how space and architecture make me feel and what is the capacity of space and architecture to really mold us. And so um, I'll quickly take you through some of the projects that we've done and point out um, how they're maybe informed by the things that I've been learning through my um, uh, involvement in the field. Lorenzo, this one? Yeah. Um, so in residential work, this one I pick up, for instance, um, because you might think this is just a house with a view. Um, but really the views were very carefully thought about. This view was very carefully set to frame this entire tree to create a relationship between, a particular relationship between the body and the landscape. And the, and the, and the house has windows that are set um, exactly, sorry, I keep going back and forth, um, exactly at eye level, because what that does is also forces you into a certain kind of a relationship with the landscape. And it isn't just you know, a biophilic environment, but it's a very thoughtful kind of engagement with the biophilic environment. 
Um, similarly, in this house, which we did in Los Angeles, it was a very, very narrow lot. Um, the way to inhabit the space was to really expand it so that we could ex we could really experience the whole boundary and to use kind of the dappled light and the shade and shadow and, you know, um, uh, all of the, the tricks of the trade that we have at our disposal to really start to create this very kind of open in and out feeling bigger than you are space, which I felt was really important in this condition. Um, in a retail store, which we, we uh, happened to do Google's first um, flagship retail store, we had the challenge of bringing a, a digital brand into the physical world for the first time. And how do we do that in a very long space, in a very difficult space? Um, the thing that I wanted to explore there was this idea of wonder, um, not all just wonder and discovery and how to be playful in technology, not to be aspirational. So we created this kind of sculpture that's like a wireframe drawing that goes through the middle of the space with um, residential spaces kind of mocked up in cork sculptures. But it leads you also to this other space where you get to experience your own relationship to technology. So there was this moment of you know this personal discovery. How do you look at things? and to dematerialize technology really and turn it into a wood clad space that's warm, that allows you to exhale when you go in there and not feel you know, the anxiety of needing to be something other than you are. Um, even the screens were dematerialized to show objects through them so that you could actually touch, feel like you could touch these things and learn more about these objects as you were looking at them. So this is just to show you some of the things that we, we the design cues that we pulled together from um, various articles, um, various researchers, lots of the work of some of the people who are here in the room. Um, in this um, interiors project, uh, for instance, this was about more about sustainability and serenity, but it really also was about allowing the client to have the agency to modify the space. So we introduced spaces that could actually be closed, opened, moved, um, and that was very important to her sense of flexibility and of kind of safety in this in this kind of space. Um, I'll take you through that. So you'll see this volume on the top that can change um, from looking in, looking out, moving a little bit. Um, and then um, to the kind of public art side of my practice, um, this was a sculpture that we made uh, that was at the Smithsonian last year. Um, and this, um, it uses technology. This was a sculpture about humans and technology and how do we look at um, the future coexisting with technology. And what I wanted to do is ask people to give me a word for their future, to speak a word for their future into the sculpture, into kind of the clusters of lights that you see um, that I called mandalas. And there was um, artificial intelligence, using artificial intelligence and machine learning, we translated the emotion and the voice into a digital code of really beautiful lights and reflected that back to people. In the center, we had this loom-like object that was weaving everyone's lights together that constantly changed, that showed people that their emotions were actually affecting someone else around them and that this is how we, we function. And what we found to be really interesting in this, you know, there's little details you'll see, but, you know, um, uh, it got wide engagement from people of all different kinds, backgrounds, ages. Um, and what we found is that people came to it with difficult words, like you ask someone to give you a word for their future and you could get something very sad. But when you give them a, a, a reflection of lights, the next word was happier and the next word was happier. And I can see this in the back end. So there's information like this that comes out of the work that's fed you know, somewhat from all of the research that I see and is hopefully leading to more work along these lines. Um, I love this picture. This, they just make me happy, this family. Um, and then this was actually one of the first public installations I did. And this was also, Using neuroaesthetic principles, um, we uh, that was it was designed really thinking about how we can make the senses uh, or a sensorial experience um, something that relates you to things that you don't even see. So, for instance, this park had fallen into disrepair, and there were these three pools that were empty. And what we did is turn them into galleries and, and surrounded them with sort of seven thousand pinwheels at different heights. And uh, the people sent in their artwork to be placed around these pools and they, they could come and visit them and they could walk around in them, they could sit in them and feel their own agency, expressing their own feelings about the park um, and also sensing the invisible forces in the park so that they could actually see when you saw the wind blowing through the thing, seeing the kind of the wonder, the awe, the discovery um, and the smiles to be very honest on people's faces uh, made me extremely happy and sent me on this, this road of saying, yes, let me do more public work. 
Um, and you'll see there were, this was during the election. So it says, nevertheless, she persisted. Things like love wins. It was really wonderful to see how people actually can use, um, uh, in this case, uh, the architecture or the art to express themselves. And really, honestly, I saved this slide because this is this is why we do what we do. We do it for people to be their best and feel their best and maybe, you know, learn a little bit more about how to be happier through what we do. Um, so some of the work um, that we're doing right now is, and with uh, this interest in neuroaesthetics is really starting to coalesce in the healthcare world. This is a prototypical hospital room that we designed. And this was working with research showing that the, um, the stress of the caregiver really affects the recovery rate of the child. And this was designed for children who had neurological disorders, so they're mostly on their backs and needed to you know, look up. Um, so we were designing, uh, coming up with this design um, uh, where we actually allowed separation for the parent, the care, caregiver and the patient. And we're using actually AR and VR also with the medical team to see if we could change natural scenes, uh, create uh, the passage of time in the room and uh, hopefully do the studies to know whether that made a difference. Uh, this next project is something that's on the boards right now and hopefully will be built next year and is called the RISE Center at Hopkins. And this center looks to alleviate some of the stress of healthcare workers who we've seen be extremely stressed before the pandemic and certainly after that even more. Um, so this is just a corridor space, but um, you know, similar to what Elisabetta was working on, we were really trying to even create the, mo the movement through the corridor, even if you weren't engaging in any of the other amenities that this offered could allow your cortisol levels to slightly drop as you needed to go somewhere else. So maybe that would be your preferred route and you could make that part of your routine in the day. Um, and it offered several spaces like a counseling space that would have a lot of green in it. And this is a hospital environment, keep in mind. So it's rather difficult to be wild with materials, et cetera. Um, and, or an art therapy room, um, which as I was listening to Juliet, was really excited to think about talking to her more about. Um, and also to work with some VR um, models that have been uh, created by some of the scientists there. Um, a sound vibrating bed that's done by a friend of mine that uses sonic frequencies to help heal people, um, to be able to offer these kinds of um, amenities essentially to a very stressed population. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that and uh, gather some data in the next year or so. Um, this is uh, sort of an, it's an emblematic project. We did this about five years ago. This was not meant to be a scientific experiment by any means. This was an exhibit designed uh, and installed in Milan during Salone, which is a, a design show. And we uh, worked together with Google and with um, the IM lab at Hopkins to create three different spaces. So my task was to design three different spaces with three different atmospheres and with music and, and, and smells and activities that were different. And people were asked to spend 10 minutes in each room without their phones, not talking to each other. And then uh, Google made a band that uh, recorded their um, things like skin conductance, heart rate variability, and two other metrics. And then we down, they downloaded that information, the data was deleted, and it was basically looked at filtering noise, looking at it for um, arousal in different spaces so that we could tell people where their bodies were perhaps at ease. Did uh, they understand that design could actually have some kind of an effect on them and that it does, it can have an effect on your biology. So these are sort of my finger paintings that I always start from, but one was a cave. I was taking my inspiration from caves. Uh, the second one was a very brightly colored space. And the third was what we refer to as kind of the sublime space. So you'll see kind of all three here, which exhibit different directions of light, different kinds of materiality, clay on the walls, bright colors. Um, for instance, if you go through, I think I have more detailed slides so you can see what the band looks like. And these anechoic chambers that actually connect it. Am I done? Oh, sorry, quick, quick, quick. Okay, I'm closing, I'm closing. So I'll just take you through this really fast. So you'll see all of them. Wow, that went back quickly. Uh, and I can end soon. There was some scorched wood in there too, Harrison. Um, oops, no, I'm skipping it. it. This I just wanted to end on. This is what it looks like when we're all together, all reacting to each other. Because all I could do is like stand outside the door and ask people, how do they feel? 
And one of the nicest things was when two of my friends came in and told me that they both smiled at each other and looked at a pop-up book and their flares were in the same place. And I thought that was wonderful. So there we have Thank it. you. Wonderful. So uh, next speaker, Carol Ricard Bredeau. She here? Yeah. Yes. Um, so from the moment that Carol attended a lecture about epigenetics in 2011, he was driven to learn about the links between human neurobiology and the built environment. She's devoted her last 12 years of practice to deepening her knowledge and of advocating for salutogenic design that supports human health. So please join me in welcoming Carol. We lost you again. I don't know why it's not opening. One second. So this one. Yeah. Let me I have to share the screen. One second. This one. Losing. Sorry. And thank you. So I'll, I'll go ahead. This is a little bit of a different story. This is my story about how to bring some of the concepts from neurophenomenology into architectural practice. Um, I am part of a firm that's about 400 people. We are a commercial architecture firm. We do, we've done a few churches, but not many. We have retail practices, healthcare, workplace, um, higher education, et cetera. So for me, uh, when, when I'm speaking about is, is designing for the conscious and unconscious. Conscious is pretty obvious what I'm designing for, the experience, but unconscious is really, by unconscious, I mean the processes in the mind and body that occur automatically that generally are not open to introspection. So I'm talking about the need to keep both of those things in mind while designing. Oh, that's good. Awesome. Um, and as Harrison said in my introduction, for me, it really started when I went to this um, conversation, this, this presentation on epigenetics and um, humans adapt to our environments on a genetic level. The functioning of our genetic codes change considerably based on the environments which we're in through methylation and demethylation. These processes affect our memory formation, our tension, our mood, our learning, they affect our immune system by changing inflammation and immune cell activity. They affect cellular metabolism, cellular rebuilding and repair. And when these processes work appropriately, we're better able to shift our tissue function to meet the specific demands within our environments and adapt appropriately. However, when they don't work appropriately, we're at an increased risk of many long-term diseases, including things like cancer. Um, all of this was news to me. As an architect, I've been practicing at that point for about 28 years, and I was kind of, kind of horrified because I felt like I was almost committing architectural mal malpractice by not understanding how the environments that we were designing really affected humans who we were designing for in either positive or negative ways. So at that point, it became kind of a passion of mine to learn and to read and research uh, as much as I could so that I could start to take in some of these concepts and make sure that we were reflecting them in the designs that we were creating. So I attended the ANFA conferences in 2012 and 2014, 2016. Um, this was also during the time of the brain initiative where they were mapping the human brain, like, like we did mapping the human genome, similar things. So there was a tremendous flood of information about our brains and how they drive our bodies that were coming out, which was fantastic. It fed my, my addiction, my need to know, uh, and it occurred to me, you know, when we talk about uh, architecture being the mother of all the arts, that maybe some of her children were not designing uh, in a way, some of them may end up being sick. For, for many architects, I think traditionally design is approached as design for the designer's experience. Results can be interesting, certainly, and striking, uh, but maybe the user's experience isn't the first design driver that's being taken into consideration. A better solution is designing with the conscious user experience in mind. To ask ourselves, how does this place feel? And I did a TED talk, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 years ago. And that was the first thing I said, how does this space feel to the audience? 
What's the multi-sensory experience? How can it enrich the lives of the people that are coming in contact with this place? But maybe the best solution was combining the conscious user experience design with unconscious design to improve human health, addressing the body, mind, and spirit. So that when we're designing, we're not only thinking about the conscious experience that someone is having, but we understand the underlying benefits that the body gains that are beyond conscious recognition. And as I learned more and more um, about the cues that our bodies take from our environments, I couldn't stop talking about it and um, started teaching a class. This is about the time uh, when Peter and Paul Shalla started developing the well building standard. Um, and so I began introducing those principles to people within the firm and created kind of a mnemonic device to help people understand and remember those things, make it as simple as possible. The ABCDs of wells. The concepts were really a starting point um, where we could have a common awareness and an understanding and a connection between human neurobiology and the built environment. The great thing about it, whoops, one. The great thing about it was that the more people in the company learned about the connections between those two things, the more they were interested and on board. I remember someone talking about how hard was it to explain lead to people when it first came out. And it was kind of like, yeah, kind of got it. But once I started talking to clients about well, immediately they got it. Everybody's interested in their own health, how to be more healthy, how to create healthy environments. So um, for us, well, design is one of the four cornerstones of our company as we move forward to become a regenerative design firm. Uh, we do take measurements. We look at impression surveys, document analysis, sensor studies, on-site observation, some mobile EEG work, um, and try to learn from it and try to understand how our environments are actually being received by the people using them. So these are just a number of the areas that we're focusing on in design. Six, I've added uh, two more principles to the things that I'm going to be running through. Active design. So the conscious benefit is creating a hub around a cool set of stairs or increasing energy, building variety into people's days. But the unconscious benefit, obviously increasing physical neuro, uh, activity to grow more neurons in the hippocampal region and helping people change posture to reduce the negative effects of being sedentary, including a slowing metabolism, dropping HDL cholesterol levels, neck and spine compression from sitting all day. The next one, a lot of people have been talking about awe or that sense of wonder um, and spaces that elicit awe, that area of focus, the delight that you get from awe when you walk into a space, that conscious experience is being um, emotional, almost spiritual, elevation in mood, a feeling of transcendence, feeling of being inspired. And whether it's a physical space that makes you feel small and part of a greater whole, or maybe one that gives you a vantage point over a city where you feel like you're part of something much larger than you, that unconscious benefit being that people that are higher in dispositional awe consistently rank themselves as happier people. Uh, it lowers stress and inflammation levels, helps people feel a higher sense of meaning and connection. And um, from the research that John Cunhas and Mark Beeman did, uh, it makes people feel more creative as well to have a higher ceiling, blue, literally that blue sky thinking. Another focus area of focus is biophilic design. Obviously the conscious experience is our natural evolutionary memory, our mind-body connection to nature, which allows us to exhale, to shed stress, just by stepping outside and looking at that beautiful image that you had, Harrison of the blue sky. Um, whether it's the most obvious application through plants or indoor, indoor outdoor spaces, or a movement of a mobile that reminds us of clouds or birds, or even a kinetic wind ivy facade that generates energy while it reminds us of leaves roughing in a, ble in a breeze. The unconscious benefit, obviously, attention restoration uh, through some of the research that Stephen and Rachel Kaplan did in the 70s, uh, increased energy, dropping cortisol levels, increased heart rate variability. Next concept is community. We talked a lot about the mirror neuron today and the, and the need and the importance of building community between people, between human beings. Conscious experience of the energy of uh, being around other people, just the hustle and bustle that signifies activity in life, whether you're participating in it or whether you're sitting on the side watching it. Cutting, combating feelings of loneliness and isolation and the unconscious benefits of, we know that loneliness has the same neural signature as fasting, nerve cells in the brain shrink and people who consider themselves lonely. There's higher inflammation response, increased levels of cortisol, sleep disruption, et cetera. So even something, and that is not a dead person, by the way, in the corner. This is a, uh, this is a school of osteopathic medicine. So just by creating a small little niche where somebody can perch and have a chance to stand and talk in between classes is something that's, that's helpful. Daylight, 
Uh, conscious experience, obviously a greater ability to see. We know that school children score higher on tests, 16% higher when they've got higher levels and appropriate levels of daylighting in spaces. Mood elevation, you just feel better. You know, a lot of people have just gone through daylight savings. A lot of people are feeling that, that darkness of the winter sort of lift off of them. And the unconscious benefits, um, obviously let people in uh, hospitals with higher levels of daylight need less pain medication. Um, higher circadian function, less sleep disruption, obviously more sleep disruption leads to anxiety and certain long-term diseases, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, all the good stuff, all the really horrific things just through sleep uh, circadian rhythm disruption. And then the last one uh, that I'm gonna talk about is variety. Um, humans like something new, we like something new. What's new, what's different, what's going on, what's happening? Um, we also like things where we have the agency of control, where we can come into a space and see something that's interesting that we can interact with, change it, move it, make it do what we want it to do. So that conscious experience is really interest, delight, excitement, um, familiar evolutionary responses of prospect and refuge, the ability to, to uh, move throughout the space and have different vantage points. Um, the unconscious um, benefits are stimulation of novelty neurons. Novel, uh, Novel stimulus in a space activates neuromodulatory systems as a consequence. So novelty has a wide range of effects on cognition. It improves perception and action, increasing motivation, eliciting exploratory behavior, and the promotion of learning. Um, additionally, spatial novelty can also trigger dopamine release in the hippocampus, having effects on reward processing, uh, learning and memory, and motivation. So. That's, that's the whole thing. So in summary, by using prevailing research and helping designers tune in to neurophenomenology, we are able to create spaces that can end up having more positive effects, both consciously and unconsciously, on the people we're designing for, making life a richer conscious experience and a more positive platform for human health in the unconscious sense. Thanks. How do I do on time? She uh, beat the clock. Um, our final speaker, Milton Schinberg, um, he's uh, a practicing architecture, taught architecture for more than four decades, is going to share his insights from both venues with practitioners and students internationally, most recently in Stuttgart, Venice, Santiago de Compostelo and Porto. His work at the intersection of architecture, neuroscience, and art propels his longtime practice. His Beauty and Brains seminar and a book now in progress on the topic. So please welcome Milton to the program. Thank you. I'm going to get them to stand up for 10 seconds. We'll start the clock. Okay. So everybody, because it's the 10th inning, everybody up. Just for a minute. Get the blood circulating again, a little physiological thing going on. Take a sharp inhale, a sharp exhale. One more sharp inhale, one slow exhale. All right. Now, um, as soon as he's ready, I'll just tell you that Harrison came up in terror a few minutes ago and said, you have 62 slides in 12 minutes. Well, that's why I want you to be energized. Now you can sit. Let me get you going here, Milton. Which one are you here? Um, no, 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 Come back really? Oh, you're going to get back to it? Yeah, I need, I need you back okay, here. Okay, let's just take a second. We're losing you. This is about getting under the hood. Which um, hood? This hood? Your feelings, your body, movement, and how you can look under the hood and find ways to change the way you design architecture. This is I'm going to talk about architecture as something to do. Um, and it also will be in two sections. One of them is about teaching which I've done a little bit of and a lot about this subject, and also doing architectural design, which has grown from the teaching has fed my design. I need you back. Are we almost good? No, nope. but it's not uh, there. Either. Well, let's just, let's just start anyway. Fill all windows bottom right. 
I think it's okay. Is th this is you, right? Yeah, yeah. that's what me. Okay. There we go. Okay. So drawing architecture from unspoken needs, what does that mean? We need to know more about our clients. We don't know enough about them, but they're our best resource. So I've gone through some processes of looking at things. It's interesting, Jan Gell, who many of you might know, says he reduces it to a very simple thing. People ignore design that ignores people. Sounds very simplistic, profoundly true. Mika Gerritsen says, architecture is where science and art break even. I don't agree they break even. I don't think we need to know which is more, which is less. It varies from architect to architect and from job to job. But I started out not wanting to be an architect, not that I didn't want to be an architect. I started out wanting to be a medical researcher. And for my teenage years, that's really what I wanted to do. And so I got a, had a Grey's Anatomy. I helped somebody dissect something at Georgetown. And I was borrowing JAMA copies from my doctors. Um, I was really into it. And then I went to the dark side because organic chemistry was a bear. OK, so science and architecture is not a one-to-one -one thing. Instead, and this is, this is my big point, that a significant design contributor, science is, to a nexus. Architects live in a nexus of, of architectural thinking, science, and art. So Witold Rybczynski, who's written some wonderful books, has great things to say about architectural space and how they feel, says, this is after a conference, somebody said, well, what's common to all the styles of architecture in all of history? He said, very simply, good architecture is architecture that makes people feel good. Well, there's a lot to do to get from that to a design, but that's an important touchstone. Okay, I like this one a lot. Adolf Loos said, architecture arouses sentiments in, let's say, people. The architect's task, therefore, is to make those sentiments more precise. And that's what we've been talking about here for the last two and a half days. So how do we shift the nexus attempting a paradigm shift. And I'll start with teaching architecture with science more in mind. Well, I actually literally bumped into a book. I was at a bookstore looking at the architecture bookcase. Next to it was the art bookcase. I was reading something and I backed up and I bumped into E.H. Gombrich. Um, I had ended up spending money. I bought a book, Art and Illusion. All of a sudden, I realized that you can break things down and understand how art actually works, how you interact with it, what's going on with it, in this case, through psychology and later cognition. A few books followed, Rudolf Arnheim, et cetera. Um, and then a few more books after that, Damasio, Bachelard, et cetera, and Hildebrand's wonderful book, Origins of Architectural um, Pleasure. Terrific resources. They happened to hit at the most opportune time. I had just been engaged to teach the freshman studio and the freshman, oh, I'm sorry, I need to mention this because reductionism is an issue for art and architecture and science, not science exclusively. Um, so I was invited to do the first year studio um, and the first year studio traditionally is a Bauhaus studio. Here are the Bauhaus folks and they would do things they called figure ground exercises. I don't think that's figure ground at all. That's just balancing black space and white space on a two-dimensional surface. So I had my students instead. We didn't do the abstractions. We started cutting out cardboard. This is a layering like a Disney animation of foreground, middle ground, background. Then we did things like this, looking at value, position. They were building these things that were not intended to be precise, except in their content not in terms of whether the architecture was precise, silhouette, et cetera. So we look at buildings, including famous buildings, and here's one uh, by Le Corbusier with, with the planning done with, uh, jointly with Doshi. What is interesting about this building in terms of figure ground? Well, I said, if you take a pattern and you run it and run it and run it and run it for a long way, that's boring. But then if you smash the pattern, it's the disruption that is figure. And so what is the purpose of figure being broken here? It's to identify where the entrance is. So we started talking about the actual behavior in response to a building. A few years later, I was asked to teach a seminar. Actually, I wasn't asked. I asked if I could teach the seminar. I've been wanting to. It's called Beauty and Brains. It's been running since 2003. Here is the Gioconda. 
uh, messing with her and the golden section and the orbits of the eyes related to it. That was kind of a core image. But one of the things that I did in the course was talk about how the brain works as much as I knew. And since 1980, I already had 23 years of reading at that point on our favorite topics. And I told him it's not a one-way thing. It's a dynamic process between cognition and perception and embodiment and movement. And I told him there were names of some things like the limbic system. It was important to talk about the limbic system. It was talk, important to talk about the cingulate gyrus, but it wasn't important to learn about the lateral geniculate nucleus. Um, there were, it was not an anatomy course. They were not intending to become brain experts. They were in, the idea was that they would understand how architecture works. So metaphor became important too. Embodiment, the one on the left, an older temple, I think it's a pastum. Is it less beautiful than the Parthenon? Well, I'm not sure, but what it makes me feel like at pastum is perspire and at the Parthenon, aspire. There's a difference in the sensibility that goes with it. Okay, so then I was looking at the Parthenon and I thought, you know, there is something that is beautiful there. It's striking. When I went there, I was just completely overwhelmed, as most people are. But the question is, what about this golden ratio thing? There's been discussion about the math and that the math is important. Well, I think it's actually something worth debunking because I think the math is there, but the biology comes first. So if you take the orbit of two eyes and you inscribe it in a rectangle, you get something very, excuse me, very close to the golden section. And when Mr. Uh, Barnock invented the first Leica, the viewfinder, actually the film proportion is the golden section. So its viewport fits our viewport. When we're doing a saccade, we're looking around, it's a series of golden sections, golden ratios. Okay, so there we have it. The question is, does fitting well with the perceptual equipment, this stuff, is that a contributor to beauty? When it feels like it fits, do we feel good? And I think the answer is, yeah, it fits. That's why in World War II, and this is much later, but in World War II, there was a study of periscope viewport proportions to see what would be the most comfortable for long times on watch. The numbers came out extremely close, very little deviation, for the golden section. Seems to be biological. Architects have intuitions. One of the things that we discuss at conferences like this is whether architectural intuitions or just intuitions devalue them or instincts. I think we can look at them as having some basis and reinforce them with what we learn from neuroscience. So here is a the layered cake. There's a bottom, a middle, and a top. The middle could be 25 stories or it could be one story. So here we have a view, this got shifted somehow, but over on the left is the angle of view, right? And people like to walk around like this without doing a lot of this, right? Our necks are, are better at this than they are at this. So what happens, what does that mean? It means that the bottoms of the buildings take priority over the middle and the top, and that's where architects spend money. There's more detail in the bottom, the middle can be neutral, and the top has a function of being silhouette against the sky. So here's a building. This is a Louis Sullivan building. It's got a bottom, a middle, and a top. Here we are looking at the lower level. And now you are going to do this because it's made more ornate at the top to cut against the sky plane to get you to look at the whole building. So what's the sequence? It's like that. So you apprehend the entire form. This is not going forward. There we go. Another issue is cognitive closure. I, I think artistic tension and ar architectural tension and musical tension are basically the same thing. And dramatic tension. You set up a condition which has some discomfort in it, something that you think is heading toward resolution. In music, you can resolve it slowly or you can resolve it quickly, right? In architecture, you can give cues that bring you to cognitive closure more quickly or more slowly. So here are a couple of buildings. Judge for yourself how long it takes to reach closure. So you say, aha, cogno means I know, closure. Okay, so sometimes buildings that are symmetrical are thought to be better because the closure happens faster. 
I'd argue that that's ain't necessarily so. That it actually turns out that the longer you stretch it, sometimes the richer the experience. So well, there's been some discussion about the striatum, which I know very little about, but I keep getting intrigued that it's got something to do with the opportunity to have novel experiences when you pierce the unconscious operations that we can do, like driving the car home without thinking about it, with things that are more acute that get our attention. So now I'm gonna talk about how this stuff works with practicing architecture. Um, this is a project, this is the first school I ever did. It's called Maya Angelou, it's not too far from here. And it was for highly distractible high school students who were so distractible, they couldn't survive in a regular school environment. So they all flunked out. Two wonderful people said, we're gonna start a charter school for them, just for them. And they asked, I, I, it was just incredible luck that I was asked to do this. Well, I was told by the teachers, we did a lot of free design. I was told by the teachers, use very mild colors because these are distractible students and we don't want to distract them. I said, okay, I'll come back with something. It's a five-story building. Here's three of the levels with stairs. I made the stairways the hottest, most intense colors I could get with, with the stairs painted themselves in complementary colors. And they're going up and down these stairs with lots of energy. They're not calm at all. They get out into the hall, and as they go from the stair toward the classroom, the colors decrease in intensity. They're no longer complements, softer. When they get to the classroom, it's like you just did. It's the neutral color in the classroom. So it's the transition, the behavioral part of the design that mattered, not the association with a pre preconception that a calm color was a neutral color. Same client, same situation. This building is very strict, no projections, not soft at all. And that's where these kids were gonna go. Teacher says to me, too bad this building doesn't have a bay window. It doesn't have bay windows. I said, okay, let's go on. How many square feet do you need for your table? Something in the way they said it made me pause. And we kept talking about it for about half an hour and discovered that a bay window in the mind of this teacher is a place of repose. It's part of a room but it's not in the middle of the room. It's a place that you can retreat to. Well, what do highly distractible students need when they are worn out by the intensity of the kind of, kind of uh, interaction that takes place? They need a place of repose. So here, the regular classroom is rectangular. That's what we started with. So here is a rectangle. And usually the lights go like this. We just turn the lights like this which made a triangular space here and a triangular space here. Lower the ceiling, soft pillows, different lighting. Students could leave the teaching table here and go, go into here, go into there. You can see the plants, the view from that, and that lower left is the view from an area of repose. Certain amount of permeability the teacher could still see, the students could still see, but they were disengaged just enough and then they would come back. Okay, um, movement wins in perception and cognition. We know it's a powerful cue. So does narrative. So here we have something from the, from the Parthenon. This ain't the Parthenon. This is the Dance Institute of Washington. But we made a freeze. Do you see a freeze? No freeze. We used, we used glass that was etched for projection. So inside the building are big projectors that show the dancers in real time across the facade like a freeze. How do we know it worked? We stopped traffic. 14th Street, busy part of DC, stopped traffic. That's our test data. This is another school. On the left is the way it looks during the day. The forms are simpler, they're reduced. These are young kids. We didn't want to make it too complicated, but we wanted some variety. At night, it's a plastic building. So it's, it's a polycarbonate building. It glows, it has a different message. So we're just tuning the permeability of it in order to make the message change without changing the building, okay? We don't do this, that's cognitive dissonance. We try to avoid that. And then just to head toward the conclusion, um, we started to try to summarize what we had learned. So we looked at you know, perception, different aspects of perception, non-visual senses, cognition, memory, affect, motion, and the buildings, those pictures on the right, are the embodiment 
for the results of that kind of thinking as it affected design. So I'll finish this by talking about the stakeholders. The people at the Maya Angelou School were the richest possible source of inspiration for us. If we hadn't listened to them, we wouldn't have come up with anything good. But because we listened to them, they saw themselves in the solutions. Approvals were quick, saved our firm a lot of money. We didn't have to go back and forth trying to get approvals because people already knew that the ideas had come from them translated by us into the architecture. It's called qualitative pre-design, not like this, regular charrette, where you try to make the stakeholders into little architects, do sketches. We weren't interested in that. We wanted to use them to engage empathically with feelings, a lot of words, narrative, reassociation, aesthetic voting, et cetera. Show them a lot of pictures, ask them to say what they like and don't like, and then a narrative discussion of why they like or don't like it. Gut reactions first, followed by some analysis. Also coming out of this using the adjectives was an affective agenda. What do you want the place to be like? This affective agenda and all these pre-designed documents then go to the designers. Their pencils are not allowed to touch the paper until this process is over and they have a chance to absorb what's been learned. One minute, almost there, okay? I'll just say that making and teaching architecture has been a two-way street all the way through. And the final, the takeaway, am I doing all right? Okay, instead of starting with creating form, which is what architects are always tempted to do, we're sculptors, we like to do it. We get a lot of good feelings out of that. Instead, and, and then moving toward the experience of architecture, first the form and then let the experience somehow happen. I'm proposing, and I think a lot of us who are architects in the room would propose, instead, begin with understanding the experience of architecture and then move toward form. Okay, so that's the talk. I'm gonna show one more slide. I'm gonna violate the time because somebody sitting here in the front row said, there's how many billions of neurons? Hmm? 10 billion. And he asked if we could experience those 10 billion neurons. So instead, I just want you to look at this for a minute. Are you feeling cognition? Maybe not 10 billion, but you're feeling a few. Okay, that's it. Um, so I've consulted with our master um, organizer, who, by the way, I have never had a conference so beautifully organized as what Julio did. So we should have a I think I got something from him every other day, and they were all helpful. I felt cared for. I felt appreciated. And um, so thank you, Julio. It's really wonderful. We're going to take a break. So um, I'm sure you've stored up your absolutely disruptive questions uh, that we can share together. Um, I don't it's not appropriate. Is our panel supposed to sit here and be? We're going to do the main conversation. So I think what you should do is if you have a question, you should um, ask it to any one of the presenters over the couple of days and see if we can start to have a constellation. Maybe we could do it is we, we get two or three or four questions on the table and then have a discussion rather than doing them one at a time. What do you think? Does that make sense to people? At least two or three? Because I think we'll start to get some, shall we say, resonance or some uh, shared, um, shared concerns is another way to say it. So let's all have a break and we'll, we'll come back. <laughs>